souls to Him belong Who holds our days within His hand What comes apart from His command And what will keep us to the end The love of Christ in which we stand Welcome to NBC at Home. It is good to gather together again and to worship our Lord. One of the advantages of doing services online is that we have had people join us from outside of Auckland, from around the world. And if that's you, we'd love to hear from you. Please drop us a line. Email us at care at nbc.org.nz. Let us know where you're joining us from. And if you are from Auckland, but new to us at NBC, we'd love to hear from you as well, so please contact us. Let's begin our worship and prayer. O oh Lord, our God, we gather together today, and we give you thanks and declare your greatness. We declare that your works are mighty to the whole world. We praise you for your wonderful deeds. Your power is limitless, your wisdom is unparalleled. Your grace is overwhelming and your love is never failing. You promise that you will never leave us or forsake us. As we worship you this morning, may your presence be tangible. May your peace surround us. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's worship will be led by Sasha and Chris. Good morning, church. It's good to be able to meet together like this again this week, isn't it? As you come to worship this morning, I want to ask you what you bring in your hands. Try reaching them out and opening them up. Do you bring grief, bitterness, pain and struggle? Or do you bring hope, gladness, joy and thanksgiving? Do you come feeling unworthy or do you come ready to give it your all? You may have reluctantly turned on the screen today or you may have been hounding the rest of your bubble to all gather ready to participate. Our God commands and compels us to worship in all situations, and we can, because although the circumstances of our lives change like the shifting shadows, our God does not. He is unchanging, grace-giving, love unending. I want you to know that your worship today is a fragrant offering to God, whatever you bring. Not because it's pitch perfect or lyrically sound, not because we come before him perfect and blameless because none of us are, but because it is a cry from our heart to his, and because he is worthy of praise. Let's pray. Lord God, we gather today to worship you. In all our situations and seasons, we choose to put you at the centre of our worship. Thank you that you meet us where we are and can handle our anguish and our joy. By your spirit, we pray a sense of peace to wash over all who come broken this morning and help us to focus on everything of who you are today.
families at NBC. Wow, how has your week gone? How's everyone in your bubble? I know that lots of families this week have been zooming in for meetings with parents and teachers and classmates and friends and work colleagues and I know it's been really busy. We've been thinking about you a lot. How has your sparrow gone? You can see our sparrows made it out into the garden this afternoon and I've really needed that reminder and I hope that you've used that reminder at home of how much God cares about us and how much he loves us. I've really needed that reminder. Now, I know that mums and dads are working super hard and I know you're working hard at school and home, at home. I know it's not easy all the time, but I love the fact that families are working together to make it work. Okay, we've sent a few ideas out for you this week that I'd love for you to try. When you're doing your highs and lows with your family at home, this is a great opportunity to pray for each other. And so some of those ideas I've sent out are on ways that you can pray for each other in your family and those that are around you. So I'm really keen to hear how you go and one of them might involve building a really special hut. So you'll have to check with mum and dad first and just see whether that'll work for your family. Okay, in a few moments we're going to hear a story read to us by Lei's beautiful family. So that's going to be really special and a lovely reminder to us about how God wants us to run to Him. Pastor Bruce is also going to share with us about a tree that is firmly planted with roots go down, that go down very deep into streams of living water. So I'm excited to hear that service and to hear what he has to share with us today. And I was wondering whether maybe at home somewhere, maybe in the garage or in the shed, you might have some seeds and whether you might be able to plant those at home this week and see whether you can grow something and how it works for you at home. Okay, right, I want you guys to have a great week and kids. Here you go. Well, got this. Oops. Oops. <laughs> The sentiments went on and on like that for some time. You see, Jesus' friends have started thinking they had to do something to make themselves special to Jesus, and that they were the cleverest or the nicest or something. Jesus would like them best. But they've forgotten something something God has been teaching his people all through the years. And no matter how clever they are or how good you are or how important you are, none of it makes any difference because God's love is a gift. And as anyone will tell you, the whole thing about a gift is it's free. All you have to do is reach out your hand and take it. So all Jesus' friends were arguing. Some people who knew all about getting gifts, in fact, you might say they were gift experts who had come to God. Who were they? They were little children. Jesus' half friends tried to send them away. Jesus doesn't have time for you, they said. He, he's too tired. But they were wrong. Jesus always had time for little children. Don't ever send them away, Jesus said. Bring the little one to me. Now, if you had been there, do you think if you had to line up to quietly to see Jesus, do you think he would, he would ask you how good your day was you, you been before he gave you a hug? If you had been on your best behavior and get dressed up and not speak until you're spoken to, or will you just have done as these children did, run up straight to Jesus, let him pick you up in his arms and swing you and kiss you and hug you, and then sit you on his lap and listen to your stories and chats? You see, children love Jesus and they knew they didn't need to do anything special for Jesus to love them. All they needed to do was run to his arm and so that's what they did. Well, after all the laughing and games, Jesus turned to his helpers and said, No matter how big you grow, never grow up so much that you lose your child's heart full of trust in God. Be like these children, they are the most important in my kingdom. Thank you. Well, kia ora, church family. It's good to gather again together and worship 
like this as we're doing again today. It's so good that so many of you can join us. And uh, thank you especially to Sasha and Chris who are leading our worship this morning. Thank you to uh, Judy Ann as she uh, leads us in another uh, kids slot and to Laia and her family. Thank you so much for that wonderful story. Hopefully you've had a chance to view our annual meeting that we sent out the link on Friday. And if you haven't had a chance to view that yet, then take a moment. Why don't you today? You'll find that on our YouTube channel and uh, you can catch up with uh, all the news uh, of life here at Northcote Baptist Church. In a moment, we are going to invite John and Robin Burgess to speak with us and uh, lead us in prayer. And today, of course, uh, we're also going to take a moment to uh, reflect on, on Anzac Day, which was yesterday. Anzac Day is the day that we together, along with our Australian cousins, remember all of those who served and died in wars and conflicts and peacekeeping overseas. It's a day to remember the contribution and suffering of all those who have served. And of course, this, this year, this Anzac has been like no other, hasn't it? I wonder if you stood at your gate at dawn. Maybe you stood at your letterbox or maybe you stood on your deck or you stood in your lounge as a symbolic way of showing our thanks for all who have served. I know that many of you did. Of course, this year it's been a very muted a remembrance because we can't gather at those familiar memorial places. And so here today in our service, we, we want to take a moment to pause and to reflect and then to take a moment's silence to give our thanks. And after John and Robin have prayed today, I want, I want to invite you to watch the uh, video along with me. And, and then after a time of silence, Sasha and Chris will lead us in a song Wairua Tapu. And uh, as they lead us in song, you might want to stand and sing wherever you are, whether you're in your lounge or on your deck, wherever you might be. It might feel a little strange, but, but that's okay. We're living in rather strange times, aren't we? So John and Robin, would you lead us in prayer? And then let's watch uh, this tribute together to Anzac. Hey, welcome to our place. It's great to have you with us this morning. Now, don't all answer at once, but how's this extended lockdown going at your place? I must say, I am glad that you and I get along well. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Oh, well, after 54 years of marriage, we still quite like each other. Mm -hmm. However, I have to say, for the first time, we are being called elderly and mm. we're vulnerable. And we've been told to go home, and we don't actually feel like we're elderly. No, we're not elderly at all. But we do feel so grateful for many of you who have checked on our well-being, checking on how we're going with our food supplies. And our extended family, our beautiful grandchildren, mm. our home group, and you, our church family, have been fantastic. And we also appreciate the inquiries about our daughter, her husband, and the four of their seven children who are in Bangladesh at the mission station in Shanpur. Uh, they are thrilled when we tell them of yet another family from the church who is praying for them. And just for the record, they're actually very safe in their compound, mm -hmm. have very little contact with the outside world at this point, and they feel very much that at this stage, they are in God's will. Yes, thank you, everyone. But mostly we thank our Heavenly Father for his protection and love for us all. So in today's reading from Psalm 1, we read, Blessed is the man who puts his delight in the law of the Lord, and on his law meditates day and night. What gives you delight? Yes, well, delight in Scripture is not merely a feeling of extreme happiness. The psalmist defines delight as immersing himself in the law of the Lord, that is, delighting in God's word. And what comes out of this constant delighting in God's word? Well, the psalmist paints a picture of a tree planted by a river. Yes, we've all seen them, tall, vital trees, well watered because they're rooted deep beside the river. 
resplendent in rich shades of green. It's a tree that can withstand frost, harsh winds, and blazing sun. Plant your roots deep in the nourishing living water and delight yourself in God's word. In Psalm 37 we read, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. Yes, he will do this. And so with this commendation from his word, let's all join together in prayer. Let's bring our prayers, our supplications, our intercessions, and our desires before the Lord. Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, Creator of all things, we bow before you, acknowledging that without you, we are nothing. We thank you so much for your plan of salvation for us that draws us together in such a strong family. We're not perfect. We never uh, feel that we can reach that perfection, but you've told us that we are saints. We have been brought into your family through the the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us on the cross. For that we are so grateful. Thank you that your love extends to us even when we feel that we don't deserve it. Lord, our world seems to be in chaos at the moment. And many people are frightened. Many people are wondering where the world is going to what their job is going to be like, where their income will come from, are they going to be able to manage without food? God, it's possible that this is all in your great divine plan, caused by the stupidity of mankind, but to be used in these last days for your purposes. Or we would ask Maranatha even so, come Lord Jesus. But if this is not the time, We ask for your people here on earth to be sensitive to the guiding of your Holy Spirit, the promptings, the nudgings, even stronger than that, to be able to um, recognize that this is an opportunity to show people that there is a hope, that there um, there is a way forward, and that way forward is the way of life, not of death. It is walking into the light and, and getting away from darkness. It is the way of delight, rather than despair. And so we bring our world before you, starting with our own families. We pray for our families, those who do not acknowledge you as their Lord and Savior. We pray particularly for them. You know them, Lord. You know the desires that are in our hearts. Those who have strayed, we pray particularly for them. Your seed has been planted in them. May it be watered and brought to fruition at this time. We pray also for our church. Thank you for the leaders that you've given us, the pastoral team, the elders, the deacons, those who are caring for our spiritual welfare as well as the day-to-day running of the church. Thank you that we have the technology that enables us still to be with each other on a Sunday. We pray that you would inspire and encourage those who lead us. We pray for our country, We thank you for the leadership that has been shown. Imperfect though it may be at times, we thank you for them, for the way that the virus is being treated and we see encouraging signs. We would not be ungrateful for that. Instead, Lord, we would say thank you. Thank you that so many people have been spared what is happening in the countries overseas. And while we pray for ourselves, we pray for those that are overseas. We pray in particular for our mission missionaries, those who are flung around the globe, for Peter, for Sophie and Ryan Bond, for Susie, for Darren and Susan, for Matt, and the others that are on our hearts. God, we pray that your protective hand would be continuing to be over them And as far as Darren and Susan are concerned, that there would be healing at this time of enforced rest, that there would be equilibrium brought back into life. And for those countries which are plagued at the moment with this virus, oh God, we do not know how you can intervene. 
We know you can, but we don't know how you will do it. But may it be that out of this comes a great revival. Those who would uh, be seeking after the meaning of life and finding it in Jesus Christ. We have the desires of our own hearts, Lord, and we bring them before you silently now. And teach us, Father, to be able to delight constantly in your word, in recognizing the promptings of Holy Spirit, and recognizing day by day that we have one who lives closer than a brother, who lives within us, your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you. We ask that these prayers now will be received by you, your throne of grace, your throne of mercy, in and through the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. Amen.
Well, this morning we're beginning a brand new series. And it's going to take us through the next three months or so. And I suspect that most, if not all, of this series will be online only, me preaching at a camera rather than looking at you. Although maybe you feel like I'm already looking directly at you anyway. By the way, one of the things that's really hard for me preaching like this is that, is that no one laughs at my jokes. Well, at least not that I know about. You might be laughing in your lounge right now, but, but I don't get to hear it. I know my jokes are not usually that funny anyway, but, but I usually get a few sympathy laughs. So it does feel a little flat for me not getting any response at all from my camera. Actually, Joe, my wife, offered to sit and listen while I preach and, and then laugh at the appropriate moment, but I didn't think that was going to work very well. She doesn't usually laugh at my jokes anyway. Well, today we're starting this new series. And I've called it hashtag blessed. Hashtag blessed. Some of you might not know much about social media. And you might be wondering, what does that character before the word blessed is? What is it? And what is a hashtag anyway? So here's a little social media lesson for those of you who don't know much about it. I, I probably should really have asked one of our millennials to give this lesson about social media. I'm sure they know much more about it than I do. When people put that symbol in front of a word in social media, it's called a hashtag. And a hashtag is really just a label to help others who are interested in a certain topic to quickly find that content on the same topic. And you use these hashtags on your social media posts and things like Twitter or, or Instagram or, or Facebook. So, for example, you might post a picture of a stunning sunset on Instagram or Twitter. And along with the photo, when you post the photo, you might add the hashtag, hashtag sunset. And then when, when people are searching Instagram for pictures of beautiful sunsets, they'll search using this word, hashtag sunset. And every picture or every post that people have made with a beautiful sunset with that hashtag will be displayed, including your one. And this is what you'll get if you search for that hashtag sunset on Instagram. Amazing. 244 million photos of sunsets. Well, you can search on any word you want to with a hash in front of it. Using a hashtag just means that, that other people can easily find all the posts or pictures with that word in it. And so I've called this, this new sermon series Hashtag Blessed. And if you do a quick search of Hashtag Blessed on social media, you'll very quickly see that this is a very popular hashtag. Why don't you try searching for it sometime? And you'll see all the posts that people are making with this hashtag. This is just a small example of what I found when I searched on the internet for hashtag blessed on Instagram. More than 122 million pictures which people have posted adding that word hashtag blessed. So this, this hashtag has become a very popular word on social media. Feeling blessed is, is very much in vogue. Blessed has, has, has been taking the, the Instagram world by storm. People are so obsessed with this, this hashtag that it's, that it's been printed on, on t-shirts and, and on sunglasses and, and coffee cups and, and water bottles. And this, this hashtag blessed in, in social media has become like the go-to term for people who want to boast about something they've accomplished or achieved but at the same time pretending to be humble about it. If you do a search on this hashtag blessed, you get a, a really clear picture of what the blessed life looks like. Many of the social media posts with this word blessed talk about fame or pleasure or influence or, or good fortune or health or, or wealth or, or holidays. You know, university scholarship, hashtag blessed. Unexpected raise, hashtag blessed. Wonderful family, hashtag blessed. Amazing holiday, hashtag blessed. Not so many of those posts these days. As someone has put it, hashtag blessed 
might as well read hashtag bragging. You know, as Christians, of course, we use that term too, don't we? In fact, blessed is a distinctly Christian term, but it's been claimed by social media. As Christians, we, we pray God will bless our family. We attribute all the good things that happen to us as, as God's blessings. We talk about our ministries being blessed. Actually, for many Christians, just like in social media, the blessed life is synonymous with the successful life or, or the good life. But you know, the, the Bible uses this word blessed and it used this word blessed long before social media started using it. it might not have had the, the hash in front of it back in those days when the Bible was written, but this word blessed is, is all over the Bible. The Bible is full of blessing. The only problem is when you do a quick search of the Bible, you find that the Bible gives us a very dif different uh, definition of what being blessed really means or who the blessed person really is. As followers of Jesus, we need to think of being blessed in a very different way. So what does it really mean? What does it mean to be blessed? What does a blessed person look like? How should we understand blessing in God's economy? And so we're going to look at this word blessed in this series. And I want us to kind of reclaim, to, to redefine this word. We're going to look at what the Bible says about being blessed. We're going to look in the Old Testament and the Psalms. And then we're going over, over to the New Testament to see what Jesus says about who, who's blessed and, and what being blessed really looks like. So today we're beginning with Psalms. We're going to begin with Psalm 1. And I'm going to read Psalm 1 uh, with you right now. Blessed is a person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, Whatever they do, prosper. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff, that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. What's the very first word of this very first psalm? Did you notice how it starts off? If you've got your Bible open there in front of you or, or the reading, maybe you've got your phone in front of you with your Bible app open to Psalm 1. What's the first word? It's the word blessed. It doesn't have a hashtag in front of it, but it's the word blessed. Blessed are those who do not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Now, this is amazing. Wouldn't you expect that the opening verse of the book of Psalms, which is like God's songbook, wouldn't you expect it to start with Praise to God. But no, this very first psalm begins with the word blessed. It starts off talking about us and not about God. When we get to the New Testament part of the series, when we go to Matthew's Gospel, when we find the opening words of Jesus and perhaps the greatest sermon ever preached in history, you know what word Jesus opens with? He also uses the same word blessed. This is such an amazing thing about God. God starts off by telling us we are blessed. The Hebrew word and then in the New Testament the Greek word for blessed really means something like happy. And we're going to explore this word in more detail later in our series. But it means much more than, than just happy. It means a sense of complete peace and fullness of life. Total well-being. It means a sense of real happiness, not happiness because of circumstances, but that deep sense of happiness that is deep down in our hearts. You know, most of us, we think that happiness comes about as a result of circumstances. You know, if good things happen to us, we're happy. 
That's why most blessed posts, hashtag blessed posts on Instagram are about good things like holidays and sunsets and parties with friends, things that make us happy. But this psalm tells us what real happiness is. And it's not about circumstances. And so the psalm starts, blessed. Now this psalm contains a promise, a promise of being blessed, but it also contains a warning. It starts off with this wonderful word blessed, but look at how it finishes. Look at the last word of the psalm. What is it? Got your Bible open? Look at the last word. It's the word perish. The person who delights in God's word is what? They're blessed, aren't they? But the person who follows their own way will what? They will perish. So this psalm contains a promise, but it also contains a warning. And these two words bookend the psalm, blessed and perish. And this, the, the opening psalm from the book of Psalms, really reflects the whole of the message of the Bible. The whole Bible reflects what this farm, psalm is stating. There are only two ways. There are only two choices. Blessed, perish. Two choices. Verse 1, scoffing at the things of God. Or verse 2, loving God's word. Just two choices. Verse 3, you can be like a tree planted by streams of water, evergreen, well-rooted, well-watered. Or verse 4, you can be like chaff that the wind blows away, dry, rootless and unstable. Verse 6, you're either a part of the way of those who follow him or you're a part of the way of the godless. Two choices, two ways. Two ways in which life can go. A promise and a warning. And Jesus taught the same thing. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus starts with the word blessed. And just like this psalm, he finishes with a warning. And he uses a story, a story that we know well, I'm sure, a story about building your house on the rock or on the sand. And the rain comes down and the streams come up and the storm set and one house stands firm and the other one crash. So there's these two types of people, says the this, says this psalm and says Jesus, people who build their life on the rock, that's the righteous, and people who build their life on the sand. That's what the Bible calls the wicked. And we'll come back to those two words in a moment. See, when we hear these two words, righteous and wicked, they're, they're very religious sounding words, aren't they? When we hear the word righteous, we, we think of people who do lots of good things. You know, we think of upright people. We think of people in good standing. When we think of wicked people, we think of those people who do really bad things. But actually, when the Bible uses these words, it doesn't use them like that at all. In the Bible, righteous and wicked are relational words. When verse 6 speaks of righteous people, it's really speaking about the person who, who understands their need of God, the person who reaches out to God, the person who loves God, the person who, who receives forgiveness from God. The righteous person is the person who has a relationship with God. That's what the Bible means when it speaks about a righteous person. And the wicked person, well, when we think of a wicked person, we think of someone who, who's evil, don't we? You know, a terrible person, maybe a murderer or someone who's done something really bad. You know, a terrorist. But the Bible speaks, when it speaks about wicked, the wicked person, it speaks very differently. Wicked's not actually a very helpful word for us, actually. When the Bible speaks of a wicked person, it's speaking of the person who lives in God's world but never gives God a thought. A person who goes their own way. A person who ignores the Bible. A person building their life on the sand. And so this, this psalm says there are two choices. Righteous or wicked. Someone like a tree or someone like chaff. And so friends, here's the question. Am I going to be like a tree or will I be like chaff? Am I building my house on the rock or am I building it on the sand? So here's the first definition of a blessed person. And it's not what we thought being blessed was. 
The blessed person is a person who's like a tree planted by the water, putting their roots deep down in God's word. So the question is, how do I become a blessed person? How do I become like a tree? That's what we all want to know, isn't it? How can I be blessed? I want to be blessed. We all want to be blessed. Well, this psalm tells us how this happens. It says the blessed person, the person who is like a tree, is someone who, what? who verse 2, delights in the law of God. In other words, the person who loves God's word. That's the person who is blessed. And Psalm 1 describes what a person who does this will look like, what they'll be like. What are they like? They're like a tree. A tree planted by streams of water, just like what John and Robin were speaking about earlier. Isn't that a great image? A tree planted by streams of water, putting its roots down deep. Picture a big tree for a moment. Think about it in your minds. Can you see a tree? Maybe it's tall, it's stately, maybe it's strong, maybe it's got huge branches. The other day I was walking along the coast, just down from our place. Don't worry, I was, I was still keeping in my own local area. We walked from our place. And, and below Kennedy Park, there's this, uh, which is this lovely park nearby us. Below Kennedy Park, there's these huge cliffs. And on the sides of the cliffs are these massive Pahutakawa trees which just hang on the sides of the cliff, hanging on for dear life, with their massive roots buried deep, deep into the rock. And so even though they're, they're, they're right on the edge of the cliff, right over the cliff, their, their massive root structure is just buried so deep that they can hang on. This psalm says a person who's blessed is like that tree putting their roots down deep in the word of God. You know, trees don't grow overnight, do they? Trees have got to put their roots deep down. Trees grow very slowly, but they can grow into these enormous trees, like those Pahutakawa trees, massive trees, but they've taken a long, long time to get into that size. And you know, our faith doesn't grow deep just after hearing one sermon. You won't walk away from your TV screen or your computer today and, and suddenly have grown so much deeper. It takes time to put roots down deep, just like a tree. But it's the only way to grow. It's the only way to be blessed. So what about chaff? You know what chaff is, don't you? Chaff is like, it's, it's the husk of the corn. It's the external protective covering around seed or around grain. Chaff hasn't got any roots. It's light, rootless, it's without substance, and it, it just gets blown away by the wind. When we build our lives on God's word, we become strong and rooted to withstand the winds that come along and blow in our lives. But chaff can't do that, because chaff is rootless. Verse 3 says, This tree's leaves do not wither, the leaves don't dry up. And friends, what this is saying is that this tree, despite all the different seasons in its life, it still grows. Its stability and its roots and its well-being are not affected by the seasons. That's a great thing to hear in these COVID-19 times. When we build our lives on God's word, it leads to, st to, to stability in our lives, despite the season we might be facing. So even if we're facing really challenging things in our lives right now, like some of us might be facing with, these, with this COVID-19, whatever the challenges might be, when we build our lives on God's word, our leaves will not wither, our leaves won't dry up. And when the wind blows, the chaff will just get blown away, but the tree, rooted and strong, remains firm. When those tough times come in our lives, whatever they might be, if we've got our roots deep down, rooted in God, then we can face them with confidence that God will be with us. The psalm goes on to say in verse 3, whatever they do, they prosper. This doesn't mean that we'll always be successful. It doesn't mean we'll always reach every goal. It doesn't, doesn't mean everything will always work out for us. 
that's sometimes what you think when you see people posting their wonderful achievements on, on, on social media with the hashtag, hashtag blessed. But what it does mean is that no matter what the season, be it a cold winter when storms come, or, or even a summer of drought uh, like we're facing here in Auckland right now, the tree will stay evergreen. See, God doesn't promise we'll be immune from the dry times. God doesn't promise we'll be immune from suffering. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't mean you'll never go through bad times or hard times. But even in the hardest of times, a tree strongly rooted will still grow. And likewise, the righteous person, the follower of Jesus, can face the toughest times, the winter seasons of cold and harshness, and still grow, and still be strong, and still prosper. So this psalm says the blessed person is the one who roots their lives in the word of God. Over in the New Testament, in the book of John, in the very opening verse in John's Gospel, we read these words. John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, friends, Jesus himself is the Word. Jesus is the one in whom we supremely place our trust. He is the Word. He is God's truth. He's the one in whom we live and, and move and have our being. You want to be blessed? Then focus your minds and your hearts and your lives on Him. Build your life on the Word, on Jesus. As that song goes, which we sang last Sunday, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. Friends, you want to know how to be blessed? You really not want to know how to be blessed? This psalm tells us, if you really want to be blessed, then God's word, Jesus, will be at the center of and the foundation of your life. Hey, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this psalm which reminds us what real blessing looks like, what it looks like to be a blessed person. God, I pray today, Lord, as we think about being blessed, that we might be people who ground our lives in the Word, in Jesus, who, gr who ground our lives in the Word of God, in the Scripture that you've given us. Lord, I pray that we might be people seeking to put our roots deep down, so that when the harsh times come, and for some of us they are coming right now, that we will be able to withstand that we'll be able to prosper even in the toughest of times. Lord, I want to pray for those who are watching today, Lord, who maybe are going through some tough times. Lord, I pray that they might be willing to put their roots down into the Word and trust the Word, trust Jesus for their future. Lord, I pray as we go through this series, through hashtag blessed, that we might come to a new understanding of what blessing really looks like. That we might become blessed people in the very real sense of that word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sasha is going to lead us in our final song this morning. It talks about the cornerstone. Christ alone. The cornerstone. Let's sing together.
friends, thanks for joining with us again today uh, in worship. We're really glad that you've joined us. We'd love to hear from you if, you're, uh, if you've got some comments or some responses you'd, you'd like to make, some stories about God's blessing in your life. You can email us. You can e email, you can get us on care at nbc.org.nz. Wherever you are, wherever you're watching this from, let us know that you've been watching and uh, how um, God is impacting your life and blessing. Friends, don't forget we have this new care fund if you'd like to give towards our care fund so that we can help those who are struggling through this time. You can uh, see the, the, the numbers on the screen uh, or you can email our church office, office at nbc.org.nz and we'd, we'd love to give you uh, our bank account numbers. Likewise, uh, don't forget uh, to give towards uh, the work of, of uh, Northcote Baptist Church and again, you can see the numbers on the screen or you can contact our church office for that. Lord, let our congregation be a witness to you. Immersed in scripture, constant in prayer, joyful in worship, generous in giving, committed in serving. We are committed to be a loving, supportive community, reaching out and serving one another and those in need. Amen. Amen. Hey friends, have a great week. Uh, for those of you going out to work this week, I hope you have a really good week back at work. Let's stay safe and let's watch out for one another and let's be kind to each other. God bless.